Now I will explain how all of the material from the previous lectures on workers' democracy, how that changes into all the ugly military dictatorship type stuff that we see in the so-called communist countries through the course of the 20th and 21st century. Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam, Korea, nothing like what I was describing as workers' democracies, military dictatorships instead. How does that change come about? The explanation begins when Vladimir Lenin takes control of Russia in 1917. The so-called Communist Revolution kicks out the Western capitalist puppet, the Tsar, the Romanovs, sold Russia out to the Western corporations, allowed the Western corporations to enslave the Russian people, kept all the money for himself, nice guy. Lenin kicks him out, wants to establish a workers' democracy, pretty much the first words out of Lenin's mouth when he takes over Russia in the name of communism in 1917, pretty much the first thing out of his mouth. We shall now proceed to establish the socialist order, all power to the Soviets. That's what Lenin wanted, Soviet socialism, as explained in the preceding lectures, but it never really gets any farther than the words out of his mouth. Because the first thing that happens, all the capitalist countries, including the United States, all immediately attack Russia, invade Russia, military invasion of Russia. Something the capitalists probably forgot to teach you. I know they forgot to teach it to me, as though it was not important. Really, of course, our invading Russia at this time was the most important event in history, defining relations between the capitalists and the communists, between the United States and Russia, between us and them. And they don't teach us this, I suspect, because we might ask, why did we invade Russia? And although a variety of excuses are given, the real reason that the capitalists invade Russia, contained in this quotation from the Prime Minister of England, this is from the book Lenin for Beginners, famous series, the For Beginners series. The reason, according to Lenin, contained in a quotation from the Prime Minister of England back in 1917, famous fellow named David Lloyd George. He was nervous, he says, that Bolshevism, Marxism, socialism might infect British workers. Use of the word infect, a direct quotation from the British Prime Minister Lloyd George. Think of what the word infect means. The British Prime Minister was not nervous that Russia would invade England. That would be ridiculous. Of course, Russia was a long way from England. And maybe they taught you England had a very powerful navy to protect themselves against invasion. But that wasn't what the British Prime Minister was nervous about. He wasn't nervous that Russia would invade England. He was nervous that socialism might infect British workers. In other words, if Lenin could successfully implement a workers' democracy, Soviet socialism in Russia, if he could make it work, because I don't want you to think you're hearing me say, oh, Soviet socialism definitely would have worked great, much better than capitalism does. I tried, of course, on their behalf to make it seem that way in the previous lectures, but there can always be unanticipated problems when you try to implement a theory into practice. I'm sure there were lots of rocket scientists thought they had it drawn up perfectly inside the drawing board. Then you take it out and the launching pad and the damn thing explodes. There can always be unanticipated problems. So I really can't be sure that Soviet socialism definitely would have worked very well, like I tried to make it seem in lecture better than capitalism does. How could I know for sure? Lenin never really got to try it. We invaded him first. Really, I'm trying to establish the opposite point. We can't be sure that Soviet socialism, workers' democracy, would not have worked so very well, better than capitalism does, like I tried to make it seem in lecture. How could we know it wouldn't work? Lenin never got to try it. We invaded him first. And the reason the capitalists invade, the capitalists are nervous if Lenin implements workers' democracy, Soviet socialism, into Russia, if it worked, 
workers in the capitalist countries would be able to see with their own eyes. Look what workers in Russia just did. They had a revolution. They kicked out their arbitrary dictatorial bosses. They're redirecting the profits that in our country is going into the pockets of the rich elite, back into their own pockets according to how much work they've done. They all just got a raise. I'm infected by that idea. I would like a raise also. Any time I find out I might be about to get a raise, I get very infected by that idea. I come home and tell my wife she gets infected by the idea, the whole family gets infected by the idea. Workers in the capitalist countries would be able to see with their own eyes. Look what workers in Russia just did. They're electing their boss. Their boss is no longer the arbitrary dictator whose ass I gotta kiss every morning. Their boss is their elected servant and representative. I'm infected by that idea. I'm tired of having arbitrary dictators. I wish my boss was my elected servant and representative. I'm infected by that idea. Why don't we do that? Workers in Russia can still start their own business, make millions of dollars. They've gotten rid of the super rich elite that dominate the government with their campaign contributions. They're having a country of the people, a government of the people. I'm infected by this idea. Why don't we do that? The capitalists were nervous. In other words, that Marx's prediction of worldwide revolution might be starting to come true. The revolution had occurred in Russia. If it was successful in Russia, workers in the capitalist countries would see a workers' democracy. They would prefer a workers' democracy to a capitalist dictatorship. The revolution would spread all around the world. And the capitalists were stimulated in their fear that the revolution would spread by the fact that the revolution was already starting to spread. As soon as the revolution broke out in Russia in 1917, workers rose up in revolution for Soviet socialism in neighboring Poland, Hungary, eastern Germany, even in parts of the United States, Seattle, Chicago, Boston, you can look all of that up. In each case, by the way, the workers were defeated. The capitalist government, their armies, had better weapons, tanks and machine guns and professional soldiers. But while the fighting in Poland, Hungary, eastern Germany was going on, nobody really knew who was going to win. So if you're the British Prime Minister Lloyd George sitting in England looking across the face of the map of Europe, what are you afraid you are seeing? Lenin has lit the fire of revolution for workers' democracy in Russia. It's starting to burn in your direction. It's starting to consume Poland, Hungary, Eastern Germany. We in Southern California know how these fires are. You never know when they're going to stop or if they're going to stop. It may burn all the way across Europe, jump the English Channel, jump the Atlantic Ocean, all the capitalist countries, including the United States, would be swept away into the garbage can of history. Workers of the world would unite. The capitalists were terrified. And so to prevent this from happening, the capitalists get the governments that they elect to direct the armies that they control to invade Russia, try to crush the workers' democracy. So the workers of the world, people like you, will never know what a real workers' democracy is, as you have never known what a workers' democracy is until I explained it to you in the previous few lectures. And although militarily the invasion of the capitalists was a failure, the capitalists retreat by 1920. I take it the capitalists did teach you, the followers of Karl Marx, the so-called communists, were in control of Russia through most of the 20th century. And the reason the invasion was a military failure, 1917 to 1920 we invade, that's taking place at the end of World War I. The capitalist countries were exhausted from fighting each other in World War I over who was going to be the dominant colonial power, by the way. Germany on the one side hardly has any colonies. France and England have all of the colonies. France and England getting rich. Germany isn't. Tensions rise. World War I. Tens of millions die. Europe is destroyed. And so the European countries, the capitalist countries, didn't have what it took right at that moment in history, at the end of World War I, to successfully invade Russia. Russia, of course, is not an easy place to invade. Ask Napoleon. Ask Hitler. So by 1920, the capitalists retreat militarily. It is a failure. But really, in a deeper sense, I am trying to argue the invasion of the capitalists was successful. It 
did what they wanted. It crushed the revolution because now Lenin realizes he cannot implement workers' democracy, what he wanted, what he thought pretty much everybody in the world would want, who doesn't want to share the profits of the rich elite among themselves, only the rich elite don't want to share their profits, who doesn't want the boss to be elected, who wants an arbitrary dictator, only the person who is the arbitrary dictator likes things that way. Now Lenin has to change from the system he thought pretty much everyone would want to something nobody wants, not even him. He doesn't want what I'm about to describe either. And I've had students tell me, oh, the capitalists taught me Lenin was a bloodthirsty dictator. That's what they'd like you to believe. All of our enemies are just bloodthirsty dictators and terrorists. Lenin wanted workers' democracy. But he realizes now he can't have workers' democracy. To fight off the capitalists, he has to implement something that we'll call, following him, war communism. This has nothing to do with socialism. This has nothing to do with communism. This is how you fight a war, Lenin realized. Change number one from Soviet socialism to war communism, one person in control, the dictatorship part. The reason for that a speedy response to the attacking, invading capitalist armies. Lenin realizes Russia is under attack, his revolution is under attack, the capitalist armies, all of them invading Russia at the same time. You can't have a workers' democracy. Democracy thrives on discussion and debate. Take a vote, majority rules. While you would be discussing and debating, what would the capitalist armies be doing? Advancing, winning, cutting you to pieces for a speedy response you need one person in control. Defensive commander, defensive captain, like the defensive captain on the football team, American football. You Americans would be familiar with this. Offense comes to the line. Formation looks unfamiliar to the defense. Do the defenders have a, cha have a chance to have a discussion? I'm not really sure what they're going to do with this formation. Do you have any ideas what they're about to do? And you, you diagnose some plays pretty successfully in past practices. Would you give us your input? Let's have a discussion. We'll take a vote. Obviously, the offense would hustle to the line, snap the ball down the field in the end zone, score, you get slaughtered. Same thing in war. You need one person in control, defensive captain, defensive commander, experienced, intelligent, recognize as quickly as possible, this is what I think they're about to do, call out the appropriate defense to everybody else. So what Lenin wants, workers' democracy, turns into its opposite, turns into dictatorship. Not because they love dictatorship the way they taught it to me, I bet they taught it to you if they taught you anything. Look at all the communist countries, Steve. See how all the communist countries have dictators, Steve. Russia has a dictator. China has a dictator. Vietnam has a dictator. Korea, Cuba has a dictator. See, Steve, communists love dictatorship, Steve. Don't you think you should join the military, Steve? Fight these dictators. Fight for freedom and democracy, Steve. Then I get to graduate school. Didn't learn this till graduate school. Then I get to graduate school. I find out that Lenin, Marx, Socialists hate dictatorship. That's why they hate capitalism so much. They see capitalism as behind the scenes, a dictatorship of the rich. Oh, they're smart enough to give everybody a vote and make it look like a democracy. But just underneath, the practical reality is it takes so much money to run for office. Ultimately, we get the choice of voting for this candidate who represents the rich or that candidate who represents the rich. Nobody can run unless they have a lot of money and thus represent the rich. They hate dictatorship. That's why they hate capitalism. They love democracy, workers' democracy. But when you're under attack, democracy is impractical. It's too slow. You lose. You need one person in control. In Russia, it's Lenin. In China, Mao Zedong. Now, of course, Xi for life. Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh. Cuba, what was the name of that guy in Cuba? Fidel Castro, of course. One person in control. Second change, this should sound familiar also, the military part of the military dictatorship. All resources to the military, the consumers, are deprived. 
Lenin realizes you have starving civilians in the interior of Russia. Back then, civilians meant women and children. Starving soldiers at the front line. One loaf of bread. Where does the loaf of bread have to go? It has to go to the soldiers, and the women and children have to be left to starve. Not that any soldier could ever be happy watching their women and children starve, but if the women and children get the loaf of bread, the soldiers will starve. What will happen next? The capitalists will win. What will happen next? The capitalists will take over Russia once again, reimpose those terrible old days of poverty and slavery. This revolution for a workers' democracy in 1917 is the Russian people's one chance to end all that poverty and slavery. Maybe it's their only chance. Ever. One thing I've learned in life, you can never be sure when you're going to get another chance at something. If there's something you really want and you have a chance, go get it right now. Maybe tomorrow it'll be gone and you'll lose it. This is our chance. Throw off what had been centuries of poverty and slavery. Give themselves the possibility of a brighter future, liberty and opportunity for everybody, not just for rich people. Try to get that established in Russia as best you can, spread the revolution as best you can. Hopefully, one day in the future, workers of the world can unite. Then they could have what they wanted all along. One world government, democratically elected, scale back the military, peace on earth, redirect the profits of the rich elite back into the pockets of the workers. People won't be so poor. Elect your boss. No more arbitrary dictators. Have a government of the people, not the rule of the special interests. Liberate humanity for ever. The spirit of war communism. Liberate humanity forever. Once you put that on the happiness scale, how many people get how much happiness? How many people get how much unhappiness? Liberating everyone forever outweighs any sacrifice made by any limited number of people. In the relatively short run, and compared to forever, the short run could be hundreds of years, the relative few, the Russian people, and compared to everybody alive and everybody who will ever live, the relative few could mean hundreds of millions may have to sacrifice for hundreds of years to liberate humanity forever. It would be worth it. And I had a student once tell me, haven't been able to verify the quotation, but the spirit of it is what's important, from Mao Zedong, leader of the Chinese Communist Revolution, if I had to kill 100 million of my fellow Chinese to save the revolution, I would be willing to do it. 100 million. Hitler only killed 10 million. That would be 10 times worse. The commies would be 10 times worse. Of course, the necessary background. Hitler killed all of those people to try to establish his ethnic group as the masters of the world. Mao was willing to kill those people to liberate humanity forever. Much different justification, of course. And my fellow Chinese, my countrymen, my family, not those damn capitalists, my fellow Chinese, my countrymen, my family, to liberate humanity forever, that would be a revolutionary duty. But again, the opposite of what Marx and Lenin wanted, whole thrust of this part of the lectures to show how all the nice things from workers' democracy turns into all of this ugly stuff, military military dictatorship. Marx, of course, wanted the minimum on the military, maximum on the people, one world government, democratically elected, scale back the military, spend the money on the people. Now, with the invasion of the capitalists, that all turns into its opposite. The military gets everything. The people get nothing. And change number three should sound familiar also. No freedom of speech. Civil liberties are suspended. Same as the United States suspended the civil liberties of Japanese Americans after the bombing at Pearl Harbor through Japanese Americans into the equivalent of concentration camps without due process, confiscated the property of Japanese Americans without proper compensation. Not to say that it was right, just pointing out it's not unusual in times of war for civil liberties 
to be suspended. And with Pearl Harbor, they hadn't even invaded our mainland. They bombed our Navy base out in the Pacific Ocean 3,000 miles. They never came close to invading California. Here with Russia, Russia is being invaded. The armies of all the capitalist countries on Russian soil. The battle is raging. It's not far away. The enemy is at the gate. The way Lenin sees this, if we are the workers putting the pins in the hand grenades and somebody starts to complain, I'm not very happy with some of the things Comrade Lenin is doing. My family is hungry. Somebody may ask them, well, what exactly is Comrade Lenin doing and how do you think he should change it? Maybe you'll give an answer. Maybe they'll give a reply. Other people will hear the discussion. They'll want to join in also. To that extent, you have distracted yourself and others from the necessary task of putting the pins in the hand grenades. To that extent, we have less grenades. To that extent, you're helping the enemy kill our soldiers. Your talking is killing our soldiers. Do you think it's appropriate that you keep talking? You're giving the advantage to the enemy. What do you call somebody who gives the advantage to the enemy? Traitor! What usually happens to them during times of war? Probably you're going to be killed can't put you in jail, we would need to take soldiers off the front lines to guard you while you're in jail. Now you've made our army smaller, helping the capitalists re-enslave humanity forever, preventing us from liberating humanity forever. With all of that at stake, the life of every human being alive, the life of every human being who will ever live, what do you think your right to shoot off your mouth is worth under these wartime emergency circumstances? Please shut up. If you refuse, I'm sorry, we're going to have to shut you up. You're going to be killed. And probably not shot. We need to fire those bullets at the damn capitalist soldiers. You'll be hung by the neck with a rope or hit in the head with something hard. And the only reason anyone would complain, in Lenin's view, was out of ignorance. Your average Russian peasant, completely ignorant, illiterate, couldn't even read, had literally no idea what in the world was going on around them. They didn't understand what Soviet socialism was and how it promised them a brighter future. You didn't understand what Soviet socialism was either until I explained it to you a couple of lectures ago. And you're all a lot better educated than your average Russian was back then. Not about this stuff, of course, so I'm being kind of sarcastic. But clearly, your average Russian wouldn't understand that the revolution was already exploding in Poland, Hungary, Eastern Germany, wouldn't understand that was scaring the daylights out of the capitalist leaders in England and the United States, didn't understand why the United States, England, the capitalists were attacking, try to crush the revolution. All the average Russian sees and knows things have gotten worse. Before the revolution, things were bad. They were living under a dictator. They were starving. They had no freedom. Now the revolution has occurred. They're still living under a dictator, one person in control. They're still starving. The military is getting everything. They still have no freedom. Now their country is being invaded. A war is going on. People are being killed. The country is being destroyed. Things have gotten worse. And as much as Lenin would have liked to have explained to the Russian people what was going on, what they were fighting for, generally people will fight harder if they think they're fighting for something good, just as a practical matter. Lenin couldn't teach them. They couldn't read, even if he could get, you know, propaganda posters and flyers to the villages, they couldn't read them. Television, of course, had not even been invented yet. Radio had been invented, but was not widely disseminated in Russia back then. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, used the radio with his famous fireside chats, try to teach the American people what was going on with the Depression, what was going on with the New Deal. Lenin didn't have radio, no means of mass communication, no way to teach the Russian people what was going on. So Lenin feels, unfortunately, I have to slam war communism down on the Russian people for what was supposed to just be a temporary period of time. War communism was not supposed to be permanent, just temporary until the capitalists are defeated. 
Then when the capitalists are finally defeated, no more capitalists to invade or threaten to invade, then Lenin wouldn't need to spend all the money on the military to protect the revolution when the capitalists invade. No more capitalists to invade, scale back the military, spend the money on the people, have workers, democracy, what he wanted all along. But of course, the capitalists never really are defeated. True, they retreat by, by 1920, but again, that's just the leftover legacy of World War I, exhausted from fighting each other over who's going to be the top colonial power in World War I. So the capitalists retreated, but the capitalists weren't giving up, they weren't surrendering, they were just resting. All right, we're exhausted from World War I, come back soldiers, we'll rest, rest our armies, regroup, try to develop better weapons, always a good idea in war. Probably the capitalists would come back and invade Russia again at the very first opportunity Lenin realized, and so he would always be stuck spending his poor country's precious resources on the military. Whenever the capitalists decide we're rested and ready, let's go invade Russia again, then Lenin better be ready with his military, otherwise they're gonna lose. And Although the capitalists retreat in 1920, we continue to be hostile to them. Although the capitalists taught me that we are a peaceful Christian country and they were the hostile and belligerent one, the fact of the matter is we invaded them first and for what they think was a pretty obvious reason, couldn't stand the prospect of a workers' democracy anywhere in the world. Workers of the world get a whiff of the idea of electing their bosses, sharing the profits of the rich among themselves. That'll be the end of capitalism everywhere in the world. And so, during the 1920s, we embargo their country's economy, one of our favorite strategies, send the mighty British Navy off the coast of Russia, don't let anything get in, don't let anything get out, try to ruin their economy, starve the Russian people, hope they'll blame their government, what would the Russian people know about a trade embargo? We ally with Russia in the 1930s through 1945 to fight our mutual enemy, Hitler and the Nazis in Germany, but everybody knows that is just a temporary alliance of convenience, and as soon as the war against the Nazis in Germany is over, the United States and Russia, the capitalists and the communists will be right back at each other's throats again, and this was the policy advocated very explicitly by the great American general famous tank commander, General Patton, blood and guts Patton. I've heard people my age who are soldiers say, yeah, blood and guts Patton, our blood, his guts. See the movie Patton, one of the great war movies of all time. He won the award, I believe he richly deserved it. Pay particular attention at the end of the movie to how rude Patton is to the Russian leaders at the peace conferences at the end of World War II. Patton didn't want peace with the Russians at the end of World War II. Patton wanted war with the Russians at the end of World War II. Patton was practically screaming at President Truman, look Truman, as soon as we defeat the Nazis in Germany, we're going to have to fight them damn commies in Russia anyway. What are you waiting for, Truman? This is the time. The American army is in Germany. It's not a long way to Russia. My tanks have gasoline. Let me drive on Moscow. I will take out those Reds. Had Patton been allowed to do that, and had he been successful? The history of the world, the lives of so many people, always at least one in my classroom I came to realize so much would have been different if Patton invades Russia, takes out the commies, no Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, no Berlin Wall, the ramifications in Asia would be staggering, no Chinese Communist Revolution, Mao Zedong after World War II gets the weapons he needs to kick out the European colonialists from his communist big brother in Russia. Patton invades Russia, no commies in Russia, no weapons for Mao, no communist Chinese revolution, of course still around today, no Vietnam War, Ho Chi Minh gets the weapons he needs to fight the French and the Americans from his communist big brothers in China and Russia. Patton invades Russia, no commies in Russia, no commies in China, no Vietnam War. 50,000 American boys died in that one. Same thing with Korea, no Korean War. And I only recently found out from my 95-year-old mother that I am a product of the Korean War. 
How does that happen? My father spent four years fighting in World War II in England. Met my mother in 1943. My brother followed shortly after. I did not come along until 1951, seven and a half years later. I never realized growing up that's a long time for parents to wait between kids. My parents just told me that they weren't going to have me at all. My brother was such a wonderful kid. They were happy just with him. But about 1950, the Korean War started brewing, and I was told the American draft policy, if you were married with one kid, they would draft you into the army and send you to Korea to fight. If you were married with two kids, you were draft exempt. So my father must have said to my mother, honey, we already got Roger. Let's get to work on Stephen. He'll be my draft exemption for the Korean War. And so if Patton had been allowed to invade Russia, I wouldn't be here explaining to you that if Patton had been allowed to invade Russia, I wouldn't be here explaining this to you. But Patton not allowed to invade Russia, the European countries that would have to help us in the fighting exhausted now from fighting each other in World War II. So we miss our chance. But we continue to be hostile. Who's running American foreign policy in the 1950s? John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, Dulles International Airport in Washington, D.C. His brother, Allen, head of the CIA. They were lawyers for the big corporations, the Manhattan Wall Street law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. They're oil company lawyers, corporate lawyers. I'll show you the book if you like. This is the book by Stephen Kinzer on the Dulleses. Read everything you can by Stephen Kinzer. They were oil company lawyers. They were famous anti-communists. So, oh, of course, anti-communists. Not that they're communists or anti-freedom. The communists didn't want the oil companies and the big corporations to be owned by the rich people who were paying the Dulleses all of that money to be their lawyers. Then, of course, Eisenhower, by the way, with his speech on the military-industrial complex when he left, too bad he learned at the end, too late. Kennedy, of course, famous rich capitalist family. Then we get Lyndon Johnson sends 500,000 American soldiers to Vietnam to fight the commies. Then we get Richard Nixon, famous cold warrior. Patton was Nixon's favorite movie, one reason why I mentioned it. He's supposed to have seen it about six times. I've seen it at least three times. Gets better every time. But that was Nixon's favorite movie. Patton, let's invade Russia at the end of World War II, take out those commies. Then, of course, we get Ronald Reagan, 1980 to 88, famous for calling Russia the evil empire. And so, when I used to give this lecture in the 1980s, shall I say that again, when I used to give this lecture in the 1980s, it would end. And so, it looks like the arms race between our two countries is going to go on forever. 10,000 nuclear warheads for the United States, enough to blow up the world many times over. 10,000 nuclear warheads for the Russians, enough to blow up the world many times over. The policy, of course, was called mad mutual assured destruction. You attack us, we'll blow up everything. Oh yeah, well you attack us, we'll blow up everything. Everybody thought that was mad, they're gonna blow up everything. And then finally, and somewhat surprisingly, war communism breaks up in Russia in the late 1980s, 1989, 1990. I like to give all the credit to President Reagan, set out during the 1980s to spend the Russians broke. Embark the United States on a huge military buildup, figuring there's only one of two things the Russians can do to respond, and either way they'll lose. If they don't try to match our military buildup, we'll get better weapons. Star Wars, smart bombs, stealth bombers, cruise missiles, predator drones. We get better weapons wherever we confront them in the world. China, Vietnam, Korea, we got better weapons, we'll win. They realized that doesn't take a rocket scientist, so they did try to match our military spending, and they wound up spending so much on their military. Keep in mind, they were much more poor as a country than we were to begin with. The arms race between us did not start in anything like an equal place. Turn of the 20th century, Russia is still the most backward country in Europe. Turn of the 20th century, the United States is already emerging as the world's military and industrial leader. And Russia was completely destroyed by World War II. The main battles of World War II 
two at the Russian front, Leningrad, Stalingrad, five, six million of Hitler's Nazi German soldiers were killed, something like 30 million Russians die, 30 million. We have a few thousand die and we freak out. 30 million Russians die. Their cities were destroyed. We rebuild Western Europe with the Marshall Plan. Russia, Eastern Europe, they don't get any aid. They didn't want it. They would rebuild on their own and they rebuild themselves into a mighty military juggernaut, second only to the United States, seen from that point of view. Very impressive. But ultimately, they couldn't keep it up. They couldn't keep up with us. We were richer. They were poorer. And so they went broke. Now they're broken. Now they're gone. Hooray, hooray. No more war communism in Russia. Although that guy who's the leader now, Vladimir Putin, wasn't he the head of their KGB, their spy agency, their secret police under the communist government? Well, whatever. Okay, no more war communism now. And the only potential problem, the only potential problem in the course of all of this huge military buildup, we are left with a multi-trillion dollar national debt and we have to pay interest on all of these trillions of dollars. You don't get to borrow money without paying interest on it. And the more money you borrow, the more interest you pay. If you only borrowed $100 on your credit card, your interest payment isn't that substantial. You borrowed $1,000 on your credit card, your interest payment is much more substantial. Borrow $10,000 on your credit card, what were you thinking? It's hard to pay the interest. Borrow $100,000 on your credit card, of course you can't afford the interest payment, you're heading for bankruptcy court. A lot of people think this is happening in the United States. As I speak, we're not getting the deficit under control. In fact, it's going to be over a trillion dollars this year with the tax cuts. The more money we owe, the more interest we pay. Eventually, it's going to reach a point where the interest that we owe on the money we have borrowed will equal or exceed what the government takes in in tax revenue in the middle of April. Then we're going broke also. Obviously, this is happening as I speak. Good luck to the next generation. And we owe over a trillion dollars to so-called communist China. They have loaned us over a trillion dollars. How does that happen? The capitalists taught me that communist countries, communist China, communist countries can't be rich. Communism is a stupid system. Communist countries can't be rich. Only capitalist countries can be rich. They've loaned us a trillion dollars. How is that possible? I'll try to explain. They don't have a communist country. They have a war communist country also. Maybe I'll do the China lecture next. They have a war communist country, one person in control, again now, Mr. Xi, for life. They have a dictator. Dictator speaks, people jump. Dictator has any idea what they're doing, things get done. Our system, democracy, not that we really have democracy, it's the rule of the rich special interests, but I mean, look at the Congress, say, even the rich special interests among themselves, they fight with each other, gridlock, nothing gets done, government shuts down. We're very inefficient and slow. Democracy is inefficient and slow. Dictatorship is fast and efficient. And I once had a student, I remember, come up to me after my socialism lecture, oh, professor, socialism would never work as well as you tried to claim it would. All of that discussion and debate, that would be too slow. Things wouldn't get done. Hey, that's not just a problem with Soviet socialism. That's a problem with democracy. Discussion and debate is relatively slow and inefficient. Dictatorship can be fast, is fast, and can be efficient. But, of course, in dictatorship, you have no way to try to protect your rights. You don't really have any rights. In democracy, you can try to protect your rights. It isn't easy, but at least you can try. Which one is better? I'll leave that to you.